Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear us well. We're going to wait one more minute before we start, just to make sure everyone is connected. Um. All right, so I think uh, we can start. So, good morning, hello again. My name is Giulia Fornione, and I'm a policy officer at Euro Eat Empower, the association representing district heating and cooling in Europe and beyond. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This is our first uh, webinar and uh, it's gonna this is gonna launch a series of other webinars that will follow in the next week um for this first one we decided to to focus on one of the EU major upcoming initiatives the renovation wave uh, as you know building renovation is key to reach the the goal set by the european green deal um, and uh, it's extremely important to improve people's uh, indoors life and health, especially now that they were spending more and more time at home. However, the, the size uh, uh, of the renovating building is also a big challenge. And it's important to consider uh, all the available technology that we will speed up the decarbonization of the building stock. So what we're trying to what we will try to do with today's webinar is to explore our measure aimed at enhancing the energy efficiency of buildings and the decarbonization of the heat supply can combine to deliver a renovation wave that makes the difference that we need. So before we start, I'm gonna quickly run you through the rules of the webinar. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so you're kindly asked to remain muted for the whole duration of the webinar. Only the speakers and the moderator will remain unmuted. Uh, the webinar will start with a five minute presentation from each of the speakers and will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, however, I invite you to already write your questions during the speaker's present presentations in the question box. Uh, the question should be as concise as possible. I will address the, the question to the speakers during Q&A. And should we run out of time, uh, uh, I will collect the question and send it to the speakers for a later response. I'm going to now introduce you to our speakers. Thank you for being here today. Next slide, please. So I will start with Paul Voss, who is the Managing Director of Euroheat Empower and that will provide us with the uh, initial remarks. Then Carlis Goldstein, who is the Energy Efficiency Advisor of the Cabinet of Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. Sorka Edwards, who is the Secretary General of Housing Europe. And finally, Max Peters, who is the Project and Network Manager of the Energy Agency of the State of Baden-Württemberg. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you for your time. Uh, I look forward to a very fruitful discussion. And now I leave the floor to you, Paul. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I guess this isn't the first webinar you've been through in the last few weeks. I'm starting to grow slightly tired of them myself. So I really appreciate so many of you um, making the time to be here and to be here on time at 9 a.m. It's great. Um, the subject we're going to discuss today is quite near and dear to my heart because I've been I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, now, one of the things I've noticed about this little crisis that we're in at the moment is everybody seems to have their own ideas about what kind of future will come after it, and of course, all of us tend to project our own um, hopes and expectations onto that future. One of the most promising narratives I've heard about the post-crisis environment is that we may have a kinder, gentler, more thoughtful type of politics. Uh, and in practice, for me, one of the encouraging things that that might bring is trying to get all of us, particularly those of us who work as, as, as advocates, as lobbyists, um, to learn to go beyond kind of blindly pushing and pushing for 
a single narrow industrial narrative, but trying to be a little bit more thoughtful about how to bring these things together so that we get the best results overall. And the collaboration between work on efficiency in the building side and the development of more and better district heating is, is a really good example. I think there's a, the, 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 any idea that there's a tension between these two things is, is simply based on a, on a misunderstanding. You know, every experience I have of this tells me that trying to decarbonize the building stock by simply renovating all the heat demand away will make the energy transition harder and slower and more expensive. And in exactly the same way, you might try and approach the problem by simply flooding the system with so much renewable energy that there's no need to worry about efficiency anymore. And this is also a totally wrong-headed approach. Um, we know as network operators that our systems work better when the buildings we're supplying are of a, of a really good standard. We're able to use low temperatures, we're able to use all kinds of streams of, of waste energy that simply don't work if you have a poor uh, and poorly maintained building stock. So district heating and highly energy efficient buildings really are and, and should be the best of friends. Now, building renovation and energy efficiency in buildings has emerged as a major topic, not only within the European Green Deal, but within the, the recovery package that we know Europe's going to need. And what is, I think, really important in the coming months as this policy begins to, to take shape is that we get a policy that, that works at a European level. This needs to be driven from Europe first and foremost, because I think we need coherence across the continent. At the same time, we also need a policy framework that makes sense to local decision makers acting on the ground and trying to apply these principles in practice. And finally, we need something that works for our customers, uh, because in the end, that's what this is all, all about. And so we're really lucky this morning to have not only a thoughtful policymaker from Brussels, um, a very experienced and knowledgeable local practitioner and a representative of a very important customer for our industry in, in the social housing sector. We're really lucky to have all three of these people here on one virtual stage. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their visions of how we can move forward together with all this. So thanks so much for being here. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Cardis Goldstein. Cardis, all yours. Hello, good morning to everybody. I'm glad that uh, everybody has joined at such an early hour uh, to listen to uh, the distinguished panelists. It's a really great pleasure to be here together with uh, Sorka, Paul uh, and Max. Maybe I take a quick tour uh, through the situation as we see it while you grab your cups of coffee and uh, sit back and relax. So basically, the Commission sees that the outlook for uh, Europe and for energy policy has never been uh, so different as, as we see today. It seems uh, it was so recently that the price of a barrel uh, was around 70, 80 US dollars. In reality, it was uh, one and a half uh, years ago. Four months ago, the oil price was around uh, 57 euros per barrel. Today, it's uh, around 25. And it, it, it even turned negative for a short period. The average electricity consumption uh, has fallen, notably in Spain and Italy, by about 20%. Offshore wind and solar, uh, they expect it to grow 6 to 8% this year, but the latest forecasts and uh, the, the fall in, in projected uh, project rollout uh, is around 20 to 33%. So throughout the crisis, um, what we should really note and be grateful for that there hasn't been any disruption of energy supply. And this is where I also thank uh, many of the people attending this seminar. Uh, you manage networks. Um, one could have expected that the the limitation of uh, physical presence in working uh, places or the limitations of uh, supply to different products would have uh, slowed down the supply or stopped it, but this didn't happen. And it's kind of good for the district heating network, as already mentioned, because people spend more time at home, they appreciate their domestic energy deliveries, and 
they they think what could be best for them in that environment of course we know that uh, some households have been hit hard they have to deal with uh, reduced uh, household income uh, and i know that the district heating cooling sector is engaging positively with the most vulnerable customers to find solutions uh, who find it difficult to temporarily pay their energy bills. But, but despite those things, uh, some signs we also observe are surprisingly positive. Uh, the share of renewables in the energy mix has reached unprecedented levels. In Spain in April, 48% of energy came from renewable sources and 72% of electricity was renewable. The attention to energy efficiency has never been so high up on the agenda as right now. People in the cities have gotten so used to the clean air that despite the declining private car purchases right now, in some markets, actually electric cars make the most of the new car sales. So to policy. Ensuring the energy efficiency first principle is very important to my commissioner. Uh, she's working with other commissioners, with the executive vice presidents and the president to have this horizontally streamlined across uh, the policy areas. You know, the multiple benefits um, which include increased indoor air uh, quality, comfort, reduction of energy poverty, and of course the stimulation of local construction markets. This is where we come to the renovation wave. Buildings are a double-edged sword, I'd say, because they are the most challenging sector to decarbonize. It's a very private, personal affair to the building owners and occupants, and Europe wants to do something about improving their state of play. So this is the starting point of uh, the debate uh, from my point of view. Um, maybe a look at uh, what we have in the pipeline, because both the, the president, executive vice president have said repeatedly that Euro the European Green Deal has to be the foundation of the European Green Recovery. So energy systems integration, quite briefly, um, COVID has shown us um, what the future energy system could look like, um, more reliant on renewables, more digitalized. And there we have a big element that ties down to building heating supply, and that's a better use of waste energy, waste heat. So in June, the Commission will present the sector integration strategy. Uh, with a much more circular energy system look. Um, and there will be a focus on uh, data centers in particular. And another vector will be the direct electrification uh, of energy. Uh, of course, the clear point of interrogation here for district heating is how it will fit into the broader notion of electrification of end use sectors such as transport, heating, certain industrial processes. Now, a couple of words on renovation wave. Um, it brings huge climate benefits, uh, it brings big personal subjective benefits. It can kickstart the economy. And this is why. The Commission is working now on the renovation wave as part of the recovery package. Um, the European Green Deal already announced such an initiative, the renovation wave, and now we're making it more ambitious and more concrete. Uh, we're going to work on identifying and re removing the barriers that are there. The obvious ones will be uh, financing and then uh, the project pipelines, whether we have them aggregated and sure enough. Uh, there will be a special attention to vulnerable, low-income households, um, houses of vulnerable consumers, hospitals, schools, uh, and apartment houses. Uh, the 
priority goal will be to make sure there's uh, fast aggregation of projects to start. I'll say a couple of words on, on financing and then I'll draw to a close. Um, it will make uh, use of all the available financial work streams. I think that's an important thing. So whether some people imagine there will be a European renovation fund, um, perhaps a specific instrument that's yet to be seen, but everything that we have already in the MFF, uh, the, the CEF, the FC, the LIFE, the Horizon 2020, uh, the Innovation Fund, the Modernization Fund, and also the future instruments, such as the uh, Just Transition Fund and the InvestEU, uh, they will all be mobilized for the renovation wave, uh, especially for technical assistance and capacity building, as I underlined already the importance of uh, preparing good projects. So through ELENA, through the EU city facility, through JASPERS and European Investment Advisory Hub. Um, Maybe the next step as well, if we look quickly forward, once the money is out there, uh, we'll have to look at uh, regulation so that it supports it, actually going through the legislative process and co-legislation where needed. And one important element that member states could start looking at, uh, but the Commission will stand by to, to help the next big topic, is going to be uh, improving access to data and markets. So that's the next step. Uh, we'll, we're dealing with money right now because the MFF negotiations are ongoing, but then the access to data and markets is going to be the, the next vector we're going to look into. So to sum up, and sorry for being a bit long, um, it is clear that the energy system is going through a very deep, uh, profound transformation right now. Uh, but it's good to hear and see that um, people are consolidated uh, around the European Green Deal more than ever before for a cleaner and competitive energy system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlis. Now we'll give the floor to Sorka. Yes. Is that working? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul and Carlis, for that introduction. Um, as uh, Julia mentioned, I'm working for the social public cooperative housing providers and uh, um, I just have a few minutes this morning to share a little bit our vision about how this uh, Green Deal can look like and of course what role can be played. Um, I think we stress um, just at the get-go um, that the, this Green Deal needs to be about values, uh, resilient communities and uh, we also can use this as an opportunity to turn those areas, maybe no-go areas, for instance, into places where people are proud to live, restore dignity for those living in fuel poverty, and crucially, and obviously this goes to the core of what our um, mission is, uh, provide decent, affordable homes in places where people can reach their full potential. Uh, so this is really at the core, not only of our work on energy, but the core of the, the work our organization does when it uh, provides uh, and uh, renovates homes. Um, obviously, I think uh, Paul mentioned it um, and Carlos as well. I mean, we're going to be um, a lot of households are going to be hit with a lot more hardship and difficulty meeting ends meet. And the main focus of the recovery package that is going to be agreed in June will be how to protect those households and how to lift. The economy and how to save as many jobs as possible um, and this is the this is the goal that's all of the governments will be sitting around the table on the on the 19th of june to to come up with a plan that can really be pragmatic um, and um, there i just wanted to yeah come back to the point that i think we're not just being opportunistic when we see that this um the renovation of buildings can really be um an excellent way to one of obviously one of the ways that can really help uh, lift the economy. Um, and what we've seen now in the social housing sector, in particular, it's often been the sector that uh, mobilizes in times of crisis. I mean, we've seen it at the time of the great economic crisis back in 2008, 
it was really the sector that um, regions and local governments and, and national governments look to to create that um, counter-cyclical impact. And um, I think this will be no different. So um, it is, it's, it's a highly effective um, stimulus measure. So investing in um, social housing, public cooperative housing. And um, what we see is that it's a, it's a progressive public investment and the benefits, and I think Carlos already mentioned a couple of times, the benefits go directly to the most vulnerable groups in society and uh, go directly to those which will be more directly hit by, by this crisis. But not only that, I mean, we've seen that every euro invested in these activities brings back about eight euro uh, to the coffers, so to the, to the national coffers. But also we see benefits in human capital, also in health, obviously, crucially. Now we are seeing more than ever the link between adequate housing and health. I mean, before the, the frontline workers in our in our hospitals, um, actually the first the, the first front line has been ho our homes. So this link between health and adequate housing has never been so never been so clear. And um, so what is the feedback we're um, in, in the face of these challenges um, that Europe is facing and that our economies are facing? What's the feedback we're getting? Um, I think it's very promising. I mean, we are seeing already commitments to um, in in many in in member states to use uh, renovation as a way to really support jobs, create jobs, and protect jobs. So we're seeing ongoing commitment. For instance, in the in the Netherlands, um, they've already committed to making 100,000 homes free of natural free of natural gas in the period between 2019 and 2022. And that commitment has not disappeared. Um, and we see also in Denmark, um, 30 billion crones has now been committed to um, renovation of social housing. So that's a 4 billion euro um, to help kickstart the economy. Um, in France, the HLM movement is saying they can put five, protect 500,000 jobs um, by producing more than 300,000 homes and 400,000 and improving 400,000 units um, over three years. So we see that there is there is um, commitment not only at European level. There's this recognition that the renovation wave can pay, play a key role, but also we're seeing that echoed in uh, in quite a few in quite a few member states. And then just to finish up, so obviously we're here today to talk about what type of renovation wave. And I've already stressed the fact that it has to be we we have. We know that it has to be a fair renovation wave that brings everybody along with it, especially the lower income groups and the vulnerable groups. It has to be a renovation wave that turns those um, and turns those neighborhoods that maybe have been forgotten into ones that people can be proud to live in. But then from a technical perspective, and I think Max is going to go into that in, in much more detail, um, um, it is one that cannot be prescribed, uh, let's say, at European level. I think at European level, the, the, the biggest favor that can be made is to have this stable regulatory framework. Um, so one that um, promotes the, um, the, the flows of finance by being by this feature of stability, that is key. That's the feedback we're continuously getting, no constant changes to the regulatory framework. So we have to assist the implementation of the, the current framework that, that is in place. And the right financing, and Carlos has mentioned all the tools that are, that are on the table. But then, in terms of how we can um, boost and support that creativity that is needed, I think I think this workshop is really going in the right direction because what we are seeing is that um, we need to focus on the the outcome, so the result of the the, the renovation works in terms of obviously. obviously comfort and quality of living for those in the neighborhoods, but then in terms of CO2 emissions and greenhouse reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this is what we, the feedback we're getting from the ground is that the organizations we work with that are, that are managing um, around 25 million homes around the EU, um, they are really working at this level, this combination, this pragmatic, but yet ambitious approach to bringing down greenhouse gas emissions at the neighborhood level. And, and what they are saying is indeed this is this means a mix on the one hand of improving the fabric of the building, um, 
say, in a cost optimal way, optimizing the performance of those buildings, but also looking at um, the switching uh, to the to the most um, suitable and sustainable heat works, the heat networks in in that district. So this is the yeah the pragmatic approach when when we actually the further we go away from let's say the, the policymakers um, here in Brussels and all of us in that circle, the more we hear that this approach is actually how it works on the ground. So this um, results oriented approach that is looking at this balance. So looking at involvement of, of people, partnership with local communities, um, production of renewable energy, switching to the, the most efficient and um, sustainable heat networks and improving the, the qualities of the building in a cost optimal fashion. So I'd like to finish off there and I'm really looking forward to hearing again how Max's organization is also uh, promoting this um, approach in, in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Sorka. Max, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm waiting for the, ah, now it's this place. Perfect. Okay, uh, good morning and thanks for having me today. Um, I want to begin you by telling you a almost daily story. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the suburban area of Waldorf, the small town I live in. Um, if it weren't for the corona crisis, I would start my daily commute by train to my office at the energy agency uh, right up there. I always pass this uh, new building area of passive houses, so these white dots to the left of in the picture. They're mostly heated by air source heat pumps. Um, and new development areas are rising every couple of years in the area, uh, thanks to the company that's in the right of the picture. The company's name is SAP, and most of them of you may recognize them, since they are Europe's largest um, and most profitable software company. On their campus, uh, they've built a data center of around 20 megawatts IT power. Uh, electricity, we call that. So just to give you an idea, such a data center is as hungry as an entire town of 50,000 people in terms of electricity. As you know, data centers produce waste heat in enormous amounts. We are talking about gigawatt hours in this case. A potential is she wasted by blowing it up in the air right next to the growing town. But today, I'm not talking about engineering solutions, which we will find for every problem no matter how difficult it may be. Instead, I want to convince you that we have the right tools in our hands to strategically link energy sources and sinks at the local level while we contemplate high-level climate protection targets. So coming back to the story, every morning I ask myself, what kind of procedures need to be introduced that empower local authorities to systematically assess opportunities and links between the building stock, developing areas, and renewable energies, while we are dealing with high-level policies in order to become climate-friendly communities. Um, my field experience from working with cities and towns has shown me that local authorities often find it hard, next to impossible, to translate European and national climate protection targets into concrete local action. Next, they find themselves in a vast jungle of engineering solutions in the field of renewables. Hence, the obvious thought is, let's pro provide them with a tool they are familiar with, and that is spatial planning or infrastructure planning. The state of Baden-Württemberg has realized this approach and is about to launch mandatory heat planning for all its cities larger than 20,000 inhabitants by introducing a new climate protection law uh, end of July this year. Um, while providing full funding, for the rolling planning process by the state, these cities will assess their building stock with its heat demand densities and come up what we call a heat cadastra. Next, through systematically uh, uncovering all sources of renewable energies and waste heat, of course, cities will then be able to link heat sources and sinks and derive strategies to transform the entire heating sector on the ground in a purposeful manner. Um, this is a process we have learned from the Danish energy transition that has already started in the 70s. Um, we will derive transformation plans in which district heating will be as relevant or as valuable as efficient single house heating solutions like heat pumps on top of necessary renovation measures. Um, 
the local transformation scheme is then driven by the target of climate neutral heat supply and building stock until the year 2050. In the next step, we will aggregate all these local plants into a statewide database and monitor the energy transformation process and developing of the heating sector in a top-down fashion. So these plants will be updated every, sing, every, sorry, every seven years, and in doing so, heat plants additionally become beneficial for creating or securing new markets, for instance, district heating, power to heat technologies, and sector coupling in a broader perspective. So what's my take on the European renovation and sector integration waves? Um, based on my experience from the ground, it seems so important that uh, any European-wide strategy implements tools that empower our cities um, to translate high-level strategies into local action plans. In my eyes, the re renovation wave calls for the explicit consideration of both reducing heat demands in buildings and the decarbonized energy supplies. To this end, I've introduced the strength of mandatory heat planning and strategic energy planning in a broader sense to you today. In our cities, district heating networks will be part of cost and energy efficient solutions together with renovation measures. But yeah, that's it for the moment and I hope that we'll start a nice discussion now. Many thanks, Max. Um, I know that Carly is about to leave soon, so I'd rather ask some questions that we receive from the public to you first. So first one will be the EIC Green Deal funding is closing today. What kind of solution or proposal you're expecting from there? So let me just uh, unmute myself. So if I understood correctly uh, the question was about uh, how funding will will play into the renovation wave i mean having that link as well um i'd say that right now it's a bit early to comment on any of these aspects because we're really in the meat of uh, negotiating the, the commission president uh, has the prime ministers on the phone to uh, set out the modifications of, of the MFF. So it's a very dynamic uh, picture, let's say. What we try to do on our end is to make sure that uh, there is more financing available than before, that it's better managed, so the programs get to the, get to the ground, make an effect. Uh, and in the combination of more and better, we hope that it will make a difference. But at the moment, um, I can't comment much more because we'll have to wait a couple of uh, days, 10 days, a couple of weeks before we can get into the next stage of those discussions. Okay, uh, I have other two for you before you go, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, how do you propose supporting access to data? For example, both on the EU building stock, energy infrastructure and residual renewable supply potentials. <clears throat> Thanks. That's a very good question because I, th I don't think it has been looked into very much detail on a high political level, but it does tie to what Max presented uh, recently. Um, the Commission uh, has required member states to provide comprehensive assessments for uh, heating and cooling, which also covers uh, supply sources and, uh, and uh, sinks. And member states should submit that comprehensive assessments by the end of this year. Um, now, what Max is proposing is a great piece of the puzzle. Uh, if uh, more and more member states would go that way, um, mapping the sources, uh, that could already help a lot district heating planning. Another element is the building stock. Um, I've heard from municipalities that they generally have quite a good overview of the size, the age of the buildings, so quite general data. Um, and that data could be used to make more policy choices. The thing is that, uh, first of all, there is not necessarily a stimulus or motivation to roll out a, an organized way of renovation in all municipalities it happens case by case or by private initiative so if there was 
uh, an interest that data could be put to use. Uh, municipalities don't always have the sufficient resources to work on that data, but I think this is somewhere something where either regions or national governments or even the EU can help step in and provide some algorithms to see what are the buildings, uh, what's their state of play, how to best uh, decarbonize them. Thank you, Carlos. I don't know if you have time for another one or you have to leave. Okay. So, will the Commission carry out a, a robust assessment of some of the limitations associated with electrification of end use, especially when it comes to heat in buildings? How do we ensure that electrification of demand is complemented, met by additional renewable and efficient electricity? That's a huge question. Uh, yes, I mean, the Commission traditionally feels quite comfortable dealing with the rollout of renewables and therefore electrifying end use. So it will be a topic now for various impact assessments. Uh, impact assessments associated to legislation uh, that will be roll up, rolled out for those end use sectors. Uh, for example, uh, when we speak about buildings, and if we, for example, decide to uh, focus more on the electric vehicle recharging points or uh, distributed uh, local individual e electrical heating or uh, electrified district heating, all of these options need to be taken into account. So uh, that's, that's one way of answering the question that when the Commission does come out with a piece of legislation, it does assess it. But, uh, there's also work going on in the background. So when the Commission isn't actively legislating, it's still gathering pieces of information and conducting studies into this. Thank you very much, Carlis. Um, I think for you, these were the questions. Uh, I would uh, suggest again, everyone to write questions in the question box and potentially if you could also address it to a speakers. Now, Carlis, unfortunately, will have to leave. But thank you very much for your time and for answering this question. Should any other question pop up, I will make sure to send it to you afterwards. Thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure joining you this morning. Have a very thank good you. continuation of the day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Okay, so now I have a question for Max. Will local town planning make mandatory for developers to connect to the local ETH networks? Um, no. So, I mean, you, you come up with a plan and uh, a plan gives you a direction where to, um, where to head in, in terms of the, the transition of the, of the sector. You can also show um, different opportunities how to implement the results. For example, where to build a grid, but um, uh, there's no legislative framework actually to um, to, to push or to um, to force a connection of a grid in the planning process. But all towns have uh, the right due to their um, um, uh, lo local frameworks to um, speak out such um, uh, mandatory connections, of course, whether it's uh, in um, in the by a decision town hall or in the private contracts of um, of the ground. So. These are the possibilities that still exist. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now have a question for all of you. I mean, you can decide who can answer to this one. Uh, how to uh, overcome the problem that grid operators have uh, now incentive to implement building efficiency because their business models are based on each sales? Does anyone wants to go? You're muted, Paul. If you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Yeah, um, I mean, I think one of, one of the things that is that is happening across the energy sector is increasingly um, there is the notion of energy as a as a service, whereby um, the role of the of the of the heat supplier or energy supplier is to provide. Uh, customers with a, with a certain level of comfort rather than to sell a certain number of, of units of, of energy. And I, I think that's the right way to think about things. Um, the other thing is, generally speaking, in, in our industry, what, what I see is, is not so much a desire to keep selling more and more heat, which might be the intuitive expectation, 
rather the focus tends to be on trying to sell less heat to more people. Uh, heat networks today uh, occupy about 12% of the, of the heat market. Most of that heat market today is dominated by combustion of oil or gas and individual um, fossil boilers. So there's plenty of scope for the business to grow, uh, to have a larger customer base uh, and ultimately to have a better business without the need for unnecessarily inefficient buildings. I've never heard somebody in our business say, oh, I wish the buildings would stop becoming so energy efficient. What I tend to hear is, I wish we'd stop heating our buildings by burning oil and gas. Okay, uh, I still have two questions left. Uh, maybe then we can have a, a quick debate among you speakers. Um, Astrid is, uh, this one is quite long, so give me, give me time to read it. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and I think this one would be for you, Sorka. Every building needs insulation. However, when there is medium higher temperature heating is available, the amount of insulation can be a bit lower to a point where it is cost efficient. Owls are not optima, optimal insulated, but less, just because there is higher temperature heating available, resulting in higher heating costs for end user and inefficient heating. Uh, or how is the maximum insulating causing, causing high cost for renovation without return of investment, inefficient renovation. So some people disrupt higher temperature heating because it might cause less than optimal insulation. The mix, as Sorka said, is important. How to find the balance? What instrument can help? I mean, you can all answer, but this I will go first. I know Max, you wanna you wanna answer. I see you, but Sorka, maybe you wanna answer as well. I um I could yes, I can go ahead. Um, so what um the key um part let's say for us the key component of the, um, the strategies of our members is this affordability that is touched upon by by the the participant. So um. Uh, for instance, I've mentioned already the Netherlands, they've committed to cost neutrality for for residents. So it means that their overall cost of living, so the, the rent and the heating cost merge, will not go up after renovation. Um, the, the French plan that I described earlier on is also committing to this, um, 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 to no increase in rent. So no, and um, you've heard of the phenomenon potentially of renoviction, so whereby after renovation you don't you don't have cost effectiveness for either the 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 landlord or the tenants so what um what your participant has touched upon there is crucial i mean getting this this balance right but it's really something that um that is taken care of at local level thank you max you want to go yeah, yeah maybe I, let me add this um it's not uh Somehow I see in this the question that reflected this this kind of uh, either or right. So the the experience shows us that you have to reduce on the uh, on the um, demand side, of course, but it is not realistic to say that this goes beyond fifty percent. So if you if you do your homework in insulation in renovation and you manage to to drop consumption down to something like low, less than thirty percent then you're ready for lower grid temperatures and then actually both worlds meet and this is what uh, many of us have uh, uh, spoken of today and i think that's that's the way to go so reduce grid temperatures don't come with steam or something like that come with maybe 60 40 degrees and deploy all uh, environmental heat sources this is very important for these networks with large heat pumps and on the building side, you have to drop them on the demand side, of course, but uh, in a reasonable and uh, yeah, in a reasonable manner, and that's that's the deal. Thank you. Should I move to the next question, which is again for you, Max? What role do you think should regions and local public authorities play in an ideal world? For instance, obligatory consultation for any national initiatives? Question mark. So the first role they should play is that they actually do their job in terms of planning. Uh, what we always see is that they are very keen on technical solutions. They're they are diving into, uh, actually they're diving into the engineering side of things. And I don't think this is uh, beneficial for the entire process. They should stick to what they know and do best, that is planning. 
and they have the capacities to doing that. So on the human capacity side, they are very good planners actually. So this is the first job that needs to be done because the solution comes after, the engineering problem comes after this. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that, of course, they should combine their um, their plans into, into a kind of regional thinking because when you come with the approach, you um, apply or when you use 100% of your renewable sources on your ground, you may up, come up with a, a surplus. And this needs to be um, transported, for example, uh, deep geothermal or huge uh, industrial um, waste heat uh, potentials need to be um, transported around. And um, this is why a, uh, the, the scaling up process of local plants to a higher level database, whether, whether it's a regional plan, whether it's across borders, we have a huge project at the moment between the cities of Kiel and Straßburg where we transport heat in gigawatt hours just across the German-French border. And you can only do this if you have plants, when you know well your building stock and its demands and your sources. And then the scale doesn't, doesn't matter in the end anymore because you come from the, from the ground, bottom up, and you can easily scale it up. Thank you, Max. I have another one for you. Should. Uh, the Danish government is tomorrow proposing to remove fossil gas as an option in its planning. That leaves district heating and heat pumps as only option. Germany? Ah, um, not, not so easy. So uh, from January on, we have a new financing background. Um, that's also funding uh, exchanging um, oil boilers and um, uh, uh, old gas boilers uh, up to something like 40%. But at the same time, we have uh, this financing framework for for heat pumps. But it is true, we are not um, we are not about to phase out gas at the moment. No, that's not happening. But the the Danish approach is completely combustion free heat production, uh, almost combustion free. So they are heading into a heat pump world somehow. But we are not there yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is about hydrogen. Will hydrogen play a role in future heating? How will hydrogen affect the heating industry and increase efficiency? Maybe Paul, do you want to go? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, hydrogen is very interesting. Of course, it's, it's, it's extremely, it's extremely uh, fashionable at the moment. And given the, the scale of our overall climate and energy challenges, I, I think it's right that we explore it uh, as fully as possible. My intuition and, and, and sense from, from talking to, to um, people who don't necessarily work directly on hydrogen is that we need to be very thoughtful about how we're going to use it because obviously um, it's going to be expensive to produce and it is likely to require, if it's going to be green hydrogen, it is inevitably, be, inevitably going to require a lot of renewable electricity. Um, behind it. So you know, my, my preference would be to see it channeled towards the sort of hardest to decarbonize pockets of our economy, whether that's heavy industry or certain certain uh, aspects of, of transport. Um, there, I, I think it's really promising. It troubles me a little bit to think about a resource like that being used for 20 degrees of heat in our living rooms. I don't know how everyone... Yeah. Anyone else wants to comment? Yeah, so the question is not uh, if it will play a role, uh, more it, when will it play a role? So hydrogen is basically a something like a storage, energy storage, and that's the, the entire story, but only for, for electricity coming from renewables, then it only makes sense. Otherwise, you can direct the heat with electricity. So from the efficiency side, it makes no sense to heat uh single houses with uh with such a valuable thing like uh, green um hydrogen makes just too too expensive so use it in larger chp plants or, or um not not chp sorry but a larger uh, facilities um when you have a surplus in electricity thank you these were the questions for the public so far we still have uh seven minutes so if anyone else has questions please uh, I, I have questions 
uh, for for my two co-panelists here, uh, one of the things that, that that's being discussed a lot at the moment, in particular in the context of the renovation wave, is 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 what people are referring to as the district approach. So I've always been very attracted to this idea that it's unfortunate to consider each building in isolation, particularly um, in an urban environment where you have buildings close to one another. Obviously, there's an opportunity to do things, uh, whether it's the renovation of the buildings themselves or uh, establishing lower carbon heat supply systems to do things at, at scale, taking advantage of the fact that these buildings can have relationships with one another. How do you two see this and how do you experience it in practice? And if I can just, um, from our perspective, we do see this as the, as um, I think if the EU takes this approach, I think they can really make a difference. And what we are actually putting forward now as, as part of the renovation wave is something called the 100 district um, renovation program which obviously as we said would not dictate uh, from from eu level what um what measures are taken we're not going to tell everybody look district heating is the way forward no it is up to each district to look at how they can be results oriented in terms of greenhouse gas emissions improvement of the neighborhood quality of life within the buildings and around the buildings and uh, what we are what we are proposing is that um um this scheme could be launched with um, without the the normal to quite heavy bureaucracy of going through um, the, the structural funds and the allocation um, criteria, and um, also with a view to checking if the current public procurement um, regime is actually fit to the to the right variety of tools that we need for for district um, for district level renovation. Um, is competitive dialogue, for instance, the, a tool that has been, been really rolled out to, to carry out district renovation, or is it actually, are the, the, is the complexity of procurement, um, the, the EU procurement regime actually um, turning out to be, to over, to over complexify the process? So um, we think that if we can really use this, um, the renovation wave to kick off this, uh, this di district level approach and really get the creativity going, you know, really get um, um, large districts bringing down their CO2 emissions with, with excellent excellence in energy planning as outlined, as we heard the example from Max, we think it can really make the difference because it can be something that can then can be rolled out and multiplied. Um, and this obviously you have to look at the individual homes, but what as well, but what we are seeing is that it's just much more pragmatic to look at the district say okay look those homes are are all at level g let's bring them up to a b or a c and let's look at how we can improve the district heating level um so and um, this pragmatic approach i think is the way forward and the eu can play a big role in uh, facilitating that now with 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 um, putting the right um funding and and the right regulatory framework on the table Okay, um, unless Max, you want to answer, we have another question from the public. So what's the panel view on energy strong and its ability to make houses closer to low temperature heat networks and improve housing quality? Is it viable even in terms of cost? I think for, um, I don't know Max, I mean, for a big part of the, the um, housing stock definitely industrialization um, and modularization of the renovation process so the, the way energy sprung works is that you are um, upscaling the renovation process through um, off-site um, um, off-site construction so you're speeding up the process of the the renovation and when you have uniformity of the building stock and um, we see that it is um, it's um, a, a process that is actually is bringing good results. I think we'd still have to bring up the scale to to bring the the cost down further. Um, and we see, yeah, Energy Sprung was really a result of um, um, creative minds at work. So really coming together to look to look at how we can overcome the obstacles of um, let's say a process taking too long, lack of integration across the building chain. Um, lack of integration of renewables in the in the envelope of the building, and they really managed to to really tick all those boxes. 
And um, so it's definitely it's definitely part of the way part of the way forward. But as we keep saying, each district the the characteristics of the building you have to look at the also the the characteristics of of the household you have to look at the potential heat sources locally. You know there is there is there's so much at stake locally to optimize this. So we cannot we cannot be saying at EU level, look, this is the way forward or that is the way forward. Energy sprung is definitely and the energy sprung approach approach is definitely part of the puzzle, but it's a really complex and diverse puzzle out there to reach those greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we need and to get the right cost. And I, I think actually that's a point I didn't mention on the district approach. And um we didn't hear it really yet, but this is obviously the difference um between a lot of the conversations we are having in the housing sector and maybe that that, that is bit, the, the conversations that are being had in industry and that's really how to work with residents and it's it's not just you know social washing of the process this is a really vital part of the process and at, at district level we're finding it even more important to put make sure you have what they're, they're being called in some cases one-stop shops but it can be an energy agency role but a trusted place where the residents can go to get that neutral information free information about what is happening and what it will mean for them in terms terms of cost in terms of quality of life so to make really people part of that process and obviously a decentralized energy production solar energy is, also has a big um role to play there so people generally not only feel a part but actually are part of the energy transition uh, and that i think comes um it has to be part and parcel of an effect effective district level approach and, and a way to make sure yeah people are partners and have ownership of this transition and benefit from it. i have a last question for max then i think we need to close okay max do you see public private partnerships as a viable option to finance the rollout of these new energy networks um yes yes of course <laughs> Um, as well as um, local uh, grid operators or utilities, especially for us, we have a lot of utilities working in our towns, uh, as well as corporations. But um, it depends on, on so many uh, economic uh, things, on the expectance of uh, returns from your grid. When you expect like huge returns, something beyond, I don't know, 5% or so, then this won't work. But if you uh, take as a town, as you take your responsibility to provide your um, people with uh, affordable and um, stable and low energy costs, then that's the way to go, of course. But it needs um, managing and it needs experience. So it's a very heterogeneous, so hard to tell from here. Okay, any final remarks you want to make? If so, then uh, I'd say we, we close the session. Thank you for everyone for your participation, both the public and the speakers. As I said at the beginning, this was just the first of a series of webinars that would follow in the coming weeks. So stay tuned and follow us on LinkedIn, follow us your hit and power on LinkedIn and on Twitter for, um, for more development. We will follow up after the, this event with um, the key bullets that were mentioned during this, um, this webinar. And if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly and uh, I will make sure your question will be addressed by the speakers. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you guys. Really interesting. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Enjoy your stay. Bye. Oh.